Hollywood loves horror movies. Scaring audiences has become big business. But with a slew of strange, deadly events occurring on and off set over the past 50 years, are these films cursed? Many people ask the question if The Exorcist was cursed. Are they making these movies without realizing what they're doing? Evil can spill off screen into the real world. Our first week of shooting, somebody died in the lake in front of the house. I thought that they were props. Somebody said, those are real skeletons. Can real life events mirror the horror on screen? There were things that were so disturbing that still to this day creep me out. <laughs> when people provoke entities, you are setting yourself up to suffer the consequences. In its pursuit of box office profits, is Hollywood tempting fate? When Hollywood tempts fate, fate tempts back. They're coming to get you, Barbara. There's really nothing better than going into a dark room with a bunch of other people where you're all experiencing the same intense emotion at the same time. And when the lights come up, there's almost like a good feeling that you survived this movie. We get that tingling, we get that dread, we get that adrenaline rush. Horror movie fans love to be scared. Fear is a great reminder that you're alive. While many love horror films, others believe that the studios are asking for trouble by producing stories that glorify evil. I do believe movies can be cursed. The energies on the other side can be evoked by actors. Those energies can reignite or even create a curse. A lot of these horror films are based on our true story. In many ways, it makes it scarier because we're being told it could happen to us. The stories surrounding several of these rumored Hollywood curses are shocking. 1982. A helicopter crash on the set of the Twilight Zone movie decapitates Vic Morrow and kills two child actors. 1988. Janet Lee's stand-in from Psycho was stabbed to death by an obsessed fan. Then in 1993, on the set of the action horror film, The Crow. A freak accident on a North Carolina movie set today killed actor Brandon Lee, hit in the abdomen by a projectile from a gun that was supposed to be shooting blanks. Lee was the son of the late martial arts legend, Bruce Lee. When you make a movie that deals with malignant energies, you are concocting this stew of tension and fear and anxiety. <laughs> You're tempting fate, absolutely. Are they making these movies without realizing what they're doing? Are they cursing the very people whom they're working with? It's Hollywood, baby. I wouldn't be surprised. In Hollywood, tempting fate has become big business. Horror, it's generally one of the more profitable genres. It's almost like Hollywood's dirty little secret because it's something that a film studio may not want to advertise, but it's going to make them a lot of money. Nobody makes more money at the box office than the devil, guys. Come on. Horror films routinely set records at the box office, raking in more than $5 billion across the globe over the past decade. The draw to horror movies is it's an escape from reality. Fear has become something that has just escalated into an emotion people just need to feel and release. So to be so-called queen of all of it is very interesting. <laughs> Linda Blair is most known for her role in The Exorcist. It's a story about a little girl named Reagan who is possessed by the devil himself. All of a sudden, I'm the most famous person in the world. She was a sensation. And everywhere that Linda went, the press was sure to go. Linda. Talk to me, Linda. Did you see the movie? I haven't seen it yet. Linda. I just want to see it. It took a while for people to realize that it was just an acting role. Hello, Linda. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? How's the head? All right? Oh, yeah. No horns? No horns. <laughs> They were unclear if I was Reagan or Linda. Nearly 50 years after its initial release, The Exorcist remains one of the top five money-making horror films of all time. If a movie is cursed, it's gonna do so much more box office because people 
are always hungry to get a glimpse of the unknown. A lot of people believe the movie was severely cursed because it's based on a true story. William Peter Blady, the writer of The Exorcist, came across a story of a little boy who was possessed. The Catholic Church regards that case as one of the very few authentic cases of demonic possession in this country. That was the basis for The Exorcist. Of course, it changed the little boy to a little girl. But at the end of the day, The Exorcist was based on fact. It is strange that movies that have to do with the occult will have spooky or strange things happen to the actors and to the crew on set. Linda Blair experienced accidents. I was definitely challenged by the physicality, fractured my lower back, but it was something that I was able to compartmentalize. One day there was a fire on a set. The set burned to the ground. And we had no idea why. And there was a lot of speculation as to what could it have been. For some mysterious reason, the bedroom where the devil possesses Linda Blair's character, Reagan, was the only part of the set untouched by flames. After the exorcist fires, they had the set blessed. A lot of people want to believe more in the curiosity, the dark side, the possibility, could it have been? And then there were others that were more apt to say, no, it's just an electrical short that happened. But a lot of people kept certain things away from me because they would never want to do anything that would scare me from going back on set. It's something that a lot of people have called cursed with good reason. Jason Miller, who played Father Karras, took his son to the beach one day when this movie was being made, and his son was ran over by a motorcyclist, and it crushed both of his legs. Jason stayed over at the Jesuit residence while we were filming, and he prayed with the Jesuits every night for a week for the life of his son, and of course his son was restored to, to life. Jack McGowan, who played Burke Dennings, he died of influenza shortly after wrapping his scenes. For true believers, the fact that The Exorcist had been edited at 666 Fifth Avenue was yet another example of its cursed DNA. 666 in Christianity is known as the devil's number. People were really buying into the subject matter and they were worried for me and they were praying for me. I wasn't raised Catholic, so I had no issue with it. I don't struggle with this movie, but I think the public does. Priests were said to be telling people that they shouldn't see this movie. This movie is evil. Billy Graham denounced it. Billy Graham said, this film is evil. There is literally evil in every single frame of this film. When it premiered in Rome, a lightning bolt struck a giant 300-year-old cross on a church that was nearby. The Exorcist is always going to be thought of as cursed because it really touches upon the balance of good and evil. Did it disturb you in any way? No, it didn't at all. I do believe in paranormal. There is a lot that we don't understand about the devil and the dark side. That's what people want to know. They want to know that God is good. If the devil comes for you, you could be saved. Can you? Coming up. Liz Moore was actually decapitated. She started howling and screaming. I knew right then and there, Post Malone was marked. Talk about the curse of the Dybbuk box. Is Hollywood tempting fate by making horror films that glorify evil? One of the most famous cursed movies is Rosemary's Baby. It can't be! The film is based on the book by Ira Levin, and it is a movie about a woman named Rosemary who moves in with her husband. He had a failing career, and he made a pact with the devil to give up his child as a means to find fame and fortune. Mia Farrow, she played Rosemary. Oh, it's a wonderful apartment. She is raped by Satan himself. And then in the end, it turns out that she has given birth to the spawn of Satan and ultimately decides to be his mother and is intimidated into silence and submission. After the movie, the producer, William Castle, received so much hate mail. Letters from angry people saying that he's a Satanist. 
and he caused all these bad things to happen. And then afterward, he got very sick. He landed in the hospital, delirious, and actually cried out, Rosemary, please drop the knife. Then he blamed it all on Rosemary's baby. He believed that he unleashed evil onto this world. The composer on the film fell off of a rocky surface, plummeted down, landed in a coma, which is very similar to the fate that befell Rosemary's friend in the film. This movie skyrocketed Roman Polanski, the director's career, and then shortly after that, he paid a huge price. I refer, of course, to the Manson murders. Los Angeles and the country were shocked to learn of a grisly trail of murders. Two of the bodies were found inside the house, one in the vehicle, and two on the front lawn. Which included the death of the actress, Sharon Tate. Polanski had directed Rosemary's Baby a year and a half prior to the murders. His wife, Sharon Tate, was nine months pregnant with the couple's first child. Sharon Tate and her unborn baby were brutally murdered by Charles Manson's followers in uh, what was quite literally a bloodbath. I felt absolutely nothing for her um, as she begged for her life and for the life of the baby. The slayings dominated the news while Polanski was working in Europe at the time. Even when I was working hard, there was always somebody coming in the evening. There was always Sharon. I saw that last step of her. They say that Roman Polanski never recovered, and a lot of people have tied Manson's followers and their activity into the satanic themes of Rosemary's Baby. Manson's whole thing was the Beatles. There was a message in the Beatles' music that only he could hear. One of Roman Polanski's good friends, John Lennon, is murdered in front of the shooting location of Rosemary's Baby. Cursed or not, the horror genre proved to Hollywood that fear had power over audiences' minds and wallets. The Omen, now there's a scary flick. It's a very frightening film and is arguably very cursed. The Omen told the story of a politician who he and his wife were trying to have a baby. They couldn't. And a baby ended up coming up for adoption. They went and got it, and it turned out to be the Antichrist. Stories spread about the Omen and troubling incidents on and off set that some connected to the fact that the film deals with the devil. Horrific events happened during the making of, prior to the making of, and after production was wrapped on this movie. Tragedy struck actor Gregory Peck even before filming began. Gregory Peck's son actually committed suicide several months prior to the start of filming. On the first day of shooting, principal members of the cast and crew survived a head-on car crash. Director Richard Donner was struck by a car. Donner said he feared some demonic force was going to strike him dead. There were a lot of instances of lightning. Gregory Peck, the star of the movie, his plane is hit by lightning. At the same time, the writer David Seltzer's plane is hit by lightning. Another time, Harvey Bernard and the director Donner were on a plane that was nearly struck by lightning that had to land in Nova Scotia that actually had the film on board with them as they had just wrapped filming. That's friggin' weird, man. On average, lightning strikes a commercial aircraft once per year. But three planes were struck within months of filming The Omen. It's up in the air, literally and figuratively, whether or not you believe that this was an act of God that was making these things happen. Later during the shoot, Gregory Peck canceled a charter flight, only to find out that the plane he would have been on crashed, killing everyone on board. It doesn't stop there. If anything, it gets even more obscure. During one infamous scene, animal trainers riled up baboons by placing them inside a car driven by actress Lee Remick. When the baboon scene was filmed, many of the animal handlers were attacked by the animals that they were trying to control. Guys, that's some spooky stuff. I mean, there's coincidence, and then there's the omen. Coming up. It had a head that was literally hanging off. I was thinking, I'm for sure getting possessed. 
There was a car crash. She was decapitated. That goes beyond coincidence for me. After The Omen premiered in 1976, the special effects artist John Richardson, who created the infamous beheading scene, got into a horrific car accident with his wife, Liz Moore. Liz Moore was actually decapitated in a manner that mimicked the decapitation scene in The Omen. And Richardson is said to have seen a sign at the time of the car crash that read a distance for Omen that was 6.66 miles away. So many things happened in and around the set of The Omen. I can't explain. Horror films like The Omen became blockbuster hits, in part because of their so-called curses. But why do we as a society put any stock in curses? If we all believe that something is cursed, we created it as a society into something that's real. High profile horror films have these curse ideas being widely promoted to sell tickets. Hollywood's power over its audience's beliefs wouldn't be possible if horror films weren't actually based on true stories. The Amityville Horror, The Conjuring, Annabelle. All of these popular franchises were based on the case files of legendary paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens are probably best known for their appearances in The Conjuring films, being portrayed by Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga. When we all were cast in The Conjuring, we were all given research materials. I just became absolutely obsessed with their story. The Warren spent more than 50 years investigating alleged supernatural events. Ed was a demonologist, and Lorraine tends to lean towards psychic medium. The original Conjuring film was released in 2013. The Conjuring is about Lorraine and Ed Warren, who come to the aid of the Perrin family. This husband and wife and their daughters moved into a rural farmhouse in Rhode Island in 1971, and they began experiencing weird things. There were life-threatening events that occurred at the farm, and I wanted them included in The Conjuring. I wanted them to know what the truth of it was. I play Andrea Perrin. She's the oldest child out of the five Perrin kids. They went through something that was really traumatic. We had several manifestations occur where there was banging, and I mean heavy supernatural banging on our front door. Uh, always three, boom, boom, boom. There were a number of deaths on the property, and I'm sure many that we don't even know about. My mother was laying in bed, and she looked up. And what she saw was so hideous. It was a woman. It had a head that was literally hanging off of its shoulders. My mother started howling and screaming. It didn't even look like her. In October 1973, Ed and Lorraine Warren heard about the parent situation and decided to investigate. Mrs. Warren walked into our kitchen and she closed her eyes and she said, I sense a malignant presence in this house. According to Mrs. Warren, everything that happened was from a malicious spirit named Bathsheba. The parents sold the house in 1980. 30 years later, Hollywood turned Lorraine's case study on the family into The Conjuring. A lot of weird things happened on the set of that movie. Vera Farmiga saw scratches on her computer monitor. When I opened my computer, and there was these claw marks <laughs> across. After we got back from North Carolina, where we filmed, the same claw marks appeared on my thigh. Oh. We all woke up between 3 and 4 a.m. every morning. It happened all the time. It also happens in the film. And every time I woke up, I just felt like I was being watched. It was creepy enough that Mahalia McFarland, who played the part of Nancy Parent, and I ended up sleeping in the same room the last couple nights of filming because we couldn't sleep. The Warrens always talked about how waking up between 3 and 4 and causing a lack of sleep is the first step in possession. So I was thinking, I'm for sure getting possessed. 
Then, a month into the shoot, a fire broke out at the hotel where cast and crew stayed in North Carolina. We had built this house on a soundstage. When Lorraine Warren came to visit the set, she walked into one of the rooms and said, there's a presence here, I feel an energy. It's attached to the furniture. She definitely felt it and it creeped us all out for the rest of the filming. A couple of weeks later, Andrea and her siblings who were visiting the set one day, she was hit by this force. This amazing wind came up and it swept down over us. The trees weren't moving anywhere and I looked at my sister, Christine, and I said, Bathsheba's curse. Miles away at the exact time when they felt that, her mom collapsed. She broke her hip at the same time that we were talking about the spirits at the farmhouse. I was stunned. Coincidence? Evil? Sometimes things happen that you can't explain. Coming up. Our first week of shooting, somebody died in the lake in front of the house. They don't let anyone touch her. I mean, who wants to risk that? I saw in the media all of this, like, is Post Malone cursed? It's not a coincidence at all. The ratings board looked at it, and they said, it's just too damn scary. The Conjuring premiered in 2013, earning $320 million worldwide and making the Warrens household names. I'm a big fan of ghost stories that are based on true events, and, uh, and I've been, you know, very fascinated by the stories about Ed and Lorraine for Warren for a long time. But why is pop culture so captivated by films that are cursed? Based on a true story pulls in people like nothing else does, especially when it comes to horror, because it's something that people, when thinking about, wow, this might have really happened. The Conjuring is a game changer for the horror genre. It pulled a lot more people to the horror genre because it is a well-made film, very frightening film. Success of these horror films means sequels. Why make one when you can make five? Annabelle is a spinoff from The Conjuring. Annabelle is a haunted doll. The real Annabelle was a Raggedy Ann doll that was bought for these two student nurses. And eventually, it started manifesting its own kind of life. It would move around the apartment. No one knows how it moved, but eventually it also started leaving notes. According to the nurses, the notes read, help us, in a small child's handwriting. Upon investigation, the Warrens told them this isn't a child that's inhabiting this doll. This is something else, something dangerous. And the Warrens took the doll from them and put it in their haunted museum. And she's kept behind a glass. Paranormal investigator Zach Baggins confronted the real-life Annabelle doll. So when it comes to haunted objects, you think of Annabelle right away. An inhuman demon is going to possess a doll to trick the living into thinking it's a little kid. What do you want, Annabelle? Be careful, Zach. Oh, my God. You had two skeletons on you. I started using the structured light sensor camera. With it, you can see light anomalies. You can see mists. You can capture apparitions sometimes. It was really interesting because a figure appeared out of her and then went into me. Next day, I'm still recovering from my investigation with Annabelle. And all of a sudden, like in the movies, the skies just turn black, they're rumbling, and then boom, lightning strike strikes a pole, a light pole, right where my car is and leaves a huge gash on the light. If I wasn't around that doll, would that have happened? Do I believe that dolls can be possessed by a demonic spirit? Yes. While it was on display at the uh, occult museum that Ed and Lorraine have, uh, somebody went in there and was antagonizing Annabelle and then ended up getting into a motorcycle accident on the way home, and I believe he died. People have been affected by her just by touching her, so they don't let anyone touch her. I mean, who wants to risk that? The original Annabelle movie began filming in 2014. The movie is named after a doll that the main character gives to his wife. Soon after, the doll is possessed by a vengeful spirit. Uh, things uh, start to go sour. Just like with The Conjuring, the cast and crew on Annabelle started experiencing bizarre occurrences. There were a lot of, like, doors closing. Lights flickering that were meant to flicker. 
I had a medicine cabinet in the apartment I was staying at in LA fall off the wall the night we started shooting. Two weeks later, medicine cabinet fell off the wall again. The creepiest thing with me was we were scouting the location and there was three finger marks through the dust above one of the windows in the living room. And the demon that we created has three talons. That's kind of weird. Actor Brian Howe experienced a creepy encounter with the Annabelle doll his first day on set. Hair and makeup trailer was uh, empty, and sitting in what was going to be my makeup chair was the Annabelle doll. And then people started coming in, and they tried to make nothing of it. Oh, well, there it is. She shows up at the strangest places. I went, oh, OK, get it out of my chair. Another famous Warrens case about a haunted house in New York inspired the Amityville Horror film series. On November 13th, 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family in the house using a 35 Marlin rifle. George and Kathy Lutz moved in with their kids to the house at Amityville, New York. They soon began experiencing weird things. At first, it started as noises and unexplained feelings, movements of things in the house. The family complained that there was uh, slime coming out of the walls, devil's hoof prints out in the snow one morning. They tried to have it blessed, and the priest came over, and he was attacked by flies and told to get out. George Lutz was awakened every night at 3.15. 3 a.m. is supposed to be the hour of the devil. George and Kathy and their children lived in the house for 28 days before they fled in terror and never returned to the house ever again. In 1976, Ed and Lorraine Warren claimed that they felt a storm of paranormal activity in the house. There is no doubt regarding the fact that that home was diabolically affected. Probably the most haunted house in history. George and Kathy recorded on tape cassette uh, everything they could possibly remember happening to them, and they gave those tapes to the author, Jay Anson, who put together the book, The Amityville Horror, in 1977. And the movie came out in 1979. No other horror movie in Hollywood history has produced as many spin-offs, 20 as of 2019. The Amityville Horror is the original iconic haunted house story. It's got everything. It's got those big creepy windows. It's got the get out voice. Get out. That classic family in a haunted house movie. Actor Jesse James played one of the Lutz children in the 2005 version, starring Ryan Reynolds as George Lutz. I have Amityville remake. The Lutzes move into the iconic house, and just immediately things start going wrong. George starts waking up at 3.15. He's hearing voices. George finally loses it and starts coming after his family. This movie is more frightening than the original movie. I feel that it helps people to understand that these forces are at work, how easy it is to open doors to allow me something like this to come in. It affects people on their weakest, most vulnerable levels. In the 2005 Amityville remake, we shot at a big house in, uh, in Wisconsin. And to walk on set every day and just see those, those big, creepy windows was great. There were definitely some uh, creepy things that happened on set. You're dealing with this true story that, that, that has such dark subject matter that, you know, I think you can't help manifest something with all that energy around. Some things happen. First week of shooting, somebody had actually died in the lake. Coming up. She felt something come out of the box that she could only describe as pure evil. There is the whole poltergeist curse. gruesome discovery near the set of the Amityville Horror remake made the cast question if something evil cursed their production. A fisherman's body that had washed up on the shore of the house where we were filming, it creeped me out enough that I didn't want to go into that lake. We had to shoot some home movie montage scene, and I remember walking through the mud hoping I, I wouldn't step on a body. <laughs> Everybody went home around 6 p.m. at night, and roughly 2, 3 in the morning, all the lights turned on in the house, every single one. 
They thought it was local kids messing around or something, but then they'd put security guards out there and, and it would happen even while the security guards were there. At one point, the guard wanted to stay in his car because, yeah, these, these lights would turn on and off at night. It was pretty freaky. Ryan Reynolds and the rest of the cast and crew would report waking up at 3.15 in the morning. It was a strange thing that everybody who worked on the film all said happened to them. It was the same thing that happened to George Lutz. It's scary to think about. Did the film's curse have a real life ripple effect? Kathy Lutz and George Lutz both died. Kathy died during the production of the 2005 film and George died shortly after the film was released in theaters. The Amityville Horror, The Conjuring, Annabelle. All these films from the Warren's case files made hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. <laughs> Just like those movies, The Possession was a supernatural thriller inspired by real life phenomena. I love stories that start in a very intense situation. We were sent an LA Times story about the true life occurrences of this haunted wine cabinet called a Dybbuk box, and we thought it was just gonna make a great movie. A Dybbuk box carries a sort of significance in Judaism. It is believed to house a spirit which seeks to take refuge in a living creature and it lives literally inside that host, feeding off of them, causing mental illness, taking over their body. Veteran screenwriter Juliet Snowden began working on the screenplay for The Possession in 2010. I always go, who is this about and what journey are they gonna go on? The Times article profiled Kevin Manis, an antique dealer who bought the wine cabinet at an auction in Oregon. Manis gave it to his mother as a birthday gift. I was downstairs in the basement working. One of my foremen came down and said, your mom's having a problem, you better, better come up and see. And when I got upstairs, she was sitting beside the box. And I said, what's going on, Mom? She had a fixed gaze, and she, she couldn't say anything. She was having a stroke. I went to the hospital, and she was able to give me a note and she spelled out the words, hate gift. Manis's mother eventually recovered. She said that when she opened the box, she felt something come out of the box and go through her that she could only describe as pure evil. So I put it up on eBay and I got rid of it. News of the wine cabinet's haunted history convinced studio execs to fast track the possession into production in 2012. The possession is a story about uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan's character who takes his daughter to a garage sale where she picks up a box. Ultimately, the demon inside of the box possesses the young girl and she has to undergo an exorcism. They were gonna use the real box in the movie, but the actors didn't wanna have anything to do with it. They wanted to bring that to Vancouver so we could see it, and I was like, no, 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 way. no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I don't wanna attempt that kind of fate. The people on the set did not want it there. So the Dybbuk box never got anywhere near the, the filming of the movie. The possession ultimately used a replica box. Still, people on set began to wonder if the Dybbuk was making its presence known. Jeffrey Dean Morgan said that he felt cold bursts of wind on closed sets, and that would only happen during key scenes. We did get to go to set for the possession. We were brought to an insane asylum that had been closed down. And there was a feeling there that was very heavy. They had light bulbs not even plugged in that had exploded. There were accounts of voices that they couldn't find where the voices were coming from. Laughter. They actually had a crew member who walked off the set and just didn't come back. He was so freaked out. After filming was wrapped, all of the props, including the prop Dybbuk box, were put into storage, and that site was mysteriously burnt to a crisp. The whole warehouse burned down. Talk about the curse of the Dybbuk box. The possession premiered in 2012. Once the tale hit the big screen, 
Collector Zach Baggins was on a mission. The world's most haunted object for a collector like me? Yeah, I want it. The haunted relic had changed hands since Kevin Manis had sold it. When I got rid of the damn thing, there was a palpable difference in my life. Darkness lifted. You could feel it. The box ended up in the possession of researcher Jason Haxton. He wanted to study it and possibly try to debunk it. And when he got the Divic box, his eyes began to bleed. So Jason Haxton ended up reaching out to rabbis and scientists who told them that you have to encase the Dybbuk box and do not open it, just keep it sealed. And that's what he did. This object is so dangerous, I've kept it buried and away from people for five full years. I wanted this box. Finally, Jason agreed to sell the Dybbuk box to me. Baggins keeps the sinister cabinet under lock and key at his haunted museum in Las Vegas. This object has caused dozens of guests here uh, to be affected, including be, you know, fainting, blacking out. This is it. This is considered the world's most haunted artifact. Baggins never touched the box until June 2018. I felt something just jolt through my body. I was panicking. I couldn't speak. Coming up. Post Malone was marked. A couple weeks later, the plane almost crashed. There is the whole poltergeist curse. We have lost wonderful people. I began to think, is somebody trying to send me a message? In 2018, TV host Zach Baggins invited rap star Post Malone to his haunted museum in Las Vegas. I'm a collector of all things weird, haunted, and cursed. Baggins introduced Malone to the Dybbuk box that the movie The Possession was based on. I put my hand on the box, and then I turned my head, and I felt like a charge go through me, and he said it was like it burned. I was crying and, and hyperventilating and panicking. It was a scary experience for us both. And he tried literally rescuing me from this room. He was just saying, Zach, 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 wake up, Zach. That gives me chills just replaying this. Post left, and the next day he sent me a photo of a huge bruise on his arm. And he goes, I don't know how I got this. And I knew right then and there, Post Malone was marked. A couple weeks later, plane almost crashed. Two tires on his private jet mm. blew out, really serious. Then after that, he was T-boned in a car accident. Then after that, a bunch of people stormed his old house looking for him with guns. And I saw in the media all of this, like, is Post Malone cursed? That's not a coincidence. The Dybbuk box is extremely powerful. When it comes to objects causing curses, Many cite the 1982 movie Poltergeist and its sequels. Poltergeist told the tale of a family terrorized by ghosts. When we were shooting Poltergeist, we had no idea what it would be like. To date, five cast members of the horror trilogy have met tragic ends. For believers, the curse began during the shooting of the first film. Several of the skeletons that were used for that scene where the dead started popping out of the ground were real. How's that for a mind-blowing revelation, right? It did bother me. I thought that they were props. And it wasn't until I finished shooting that somebody said, no, those are real skeletons. And that really creeped me out. I was glad I hadn't known when I was in the swimming pool with them. If a dead person was still attached to their body, it could have disturbed them to see their body used in a way that they wouldn't have deemed appropriate. And then they could cause and create chaos. While shooting the first three Poltergeist films, the cast and crew experienced many eerie events. I would come home every evening, and the pictures in the apartment would be crooked and I would straighten them, and I would go to work the next day, and I'd come home, and the pictures would be crooked again. I began to think, is somebody trying to send me a message that I shouldn't be doing this film? There was bad stuff going on there. Uh, there was people getting sick. 
That was really frightening. There was a problem with the film. They did like a day shooting, and it did come back blank. Actor Will Sampson, who starred in Poltergeist 2, started sensing negative energy surrounding the film. Things were not going well. We we're getting way behind. So Will felt that there was some spirits that were upset. Early one morning, Samson, who was a shaman in real life, performed a cleansing ritual on the soundstage. He did come in with ashes and smoke and certain herbs that he would burn and bless the set. Whatever it was, it worked, and there wasn't any problem after that. Still, once members of the cast began dying unexpectedly, people truly started buying into the idea that the films were cursed. There is the whole poltergeist curse. We have lost more than our fair share of wonderful people. The first tragic loss was Dominique Dunn, who starred in the original Poltergeist. About five months after the movie was done filming, Dominique's abusive boyfriend tracked her down, strangled her, and she went into a coma. They found the 22-year-old actress lying on the ground outside her West Hollywood home. She was brain dead and stayed in the hospital for about five days until her parents took her off of life support and she died. She was a wonderful up and coming young star. When she was killed, we were stunned. That was really a tragedy. Then in 1987, one year after the sequel's release, Will Sampson died from complications following surgery. I was deeply saddened and very shocked because he had seemed like, you know, big strapping guy, not that ill. When child actress Heather O'Rourke suddenly died just months after filming Poltergeist 3, fears about a curse hit fever pitch. The little girl that played Carol Ann sadly passed away at the age of 12. Heather died from intestinal stenosis, which was misdiagnosed as Crohn's disease. When Heather died, I was bereft. I, I couldn't believe it. It just killed me, that loss, because she was an extraordinary little girl. There's an old saying, the more energy that you give a malevolent spirit, the stronger it gets. And certain things happen to certain people that there just isn't an explanation for. I still want to believe, but I also don't. And I think that's why I love horror movies so much, because there's something else out there that's unexplained. The mystery is what keeps bringing me back. What you can conjure in here is far more terrifying. Whether horror movie curses are real or not, as long as there's the incredible power of belief, Hollywood will continue tempting fate and cashing in. There are some that look at Hollywood dealing with the dark side, paranormal, the devil, that it is bringing bad so-called juju. For me, it's all for the greater good of trying to entertain people. Next on True Hollywood Story. I live for this. I love this. Fame can be as addictive as any drug. That quick rush you wanted to get. You have to navigate fame very carefully. It messes with your emotions. Get out of here. You're a bitch. Fame can drive dangerous behavior. What you say? There's so many people out there that will do anything to stay relevant. That's addiction. If you keep doing something crazier, people are gonna keep looking. We like watching the craziness. I thought the bitch was wise!